called this message, May God Be Glorified, that God may be glorified. Some of you know the, a bit of this story that I'm going to start with already, but to me it fits in very well, so I'm going to repeat it again. When Scott was in high school, he, he started really having trouble seeing and, and seeing the blackboard, but he refused to have his eyes checked because he was adamant that he was not going to wear glasses. And it's interesting, through all of this, the glasses do not fix the problem that he has. I just thought that's, so I was preparing, I was thinking, that's interesting. He refused to wear glasses, but glasses wouldn't have helped anyway. By 2008, his sight was bad enough that he finally agreed to go for an eye exam. And after a number of tests, they found out that he has keratoconus, which is degenerate corneas, in both of his eyes. Much, much worse in his right eye than his left eye. Doctors don't know the cause of it. They don't know how, how fast it will progress. The prognosis is blindness. There was nothing at that time in 2008, there was nothing that they could do. When it got really, really bad, it, it would have had to get really seriously bad. He wouldn't have been able to drive or do much anymore as far as seeing. Then they would have considered a cornea transplant. Then in the summer of 2009, I happened to be in a conversation with uh, a relative of Duane's in Ontario, and she told me about a brand new surgery that had just been approved in some of the Canadian provinces. And when I came home, I found out that it was approved in, Canada, in uh, Saskatchewan. So I contacted Scott's ophthalmologist immediately, and he had just heard of it as well. And it just so happened, just so happened, that Scott's ophthalmologist in Regina was doing the surgery. And surgery, Scott had the surgery in both of his eyes in 2010. It didn't make his sight any better, but it was supposed to keep it from getting worse. We were very thankful for that. But over time, the specialty contacts that he wore were seriously damaging his eyes. And it got to be very, very serious again. So he was referred to another ophthalmologist in Brandon, Manitoba. And in 2017, he had two more surgeries uh, with newer technology that has happened over the last while. The sight in his left eye is now, and I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, Jane, it's 20, 2025, is that the way he says, you say it? 25 is the number out of 20, and actually what he sees. So he has very good sight in his, in his uh, left eye. They weren't able to do the third surgery in his right eye because the curvature of the cornea is still too steep. And uh, so, but we're, we're thankful for the sight that he has in his left eye. Someone asked me recently if this is the end of it. And as I thought about it, I could only respond. We thought it was the end of it in 2010. When he had the surgery in 2010, that we thought, okay, that's the end of it. Um, so we're not sure what can happen yet. Uh, it would be nice if there'd be even newer technology that comes along that could, that could help out. Scott is very thankful for the sight that he has in his right eye. Or his, I should say his good eye, his left eye. And he thinks that losing your sight has to be one of the worst or has to be the worst of the senses to lose. And we've talked about that a number of times and I tend to agree with him that it's got to be almost the worst thing is losing, losing your sight. But as we look back, we see the hand of God. I see the hand of God with Scott as I look back even over the story just in the last two weeks again. That God was with Scott. God was walking with Scott and with us as a family through all of it. Today we're looking at another one of John's signs in, John, in, his, in his gospel. And it's a story of the man born blind. Now I can't imagine what that must be like. Scott has had a fear over the years of going blind. But being born blind means you have never had a chance to see. You never saw your mom or dad. A sunset, a new baby. You don't know what the color red looks like. So I'd like us to read the story from John 9 and I'm going to invite Nate and Jed and Orlando to come and we'll do the story together. Do you want to use the other mic as well for the voice? You can bring it up if you want. So this is John, John chapter 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Teacher, why is this man born blind? Was it a result of his own sins or those of his parents? It wasn't because of his sins or his parents' sins. He was born blind. 
on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and smoothed the mud over the blind man's eyes. Jesus told him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means sent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, Is this the same man, that beggar? Some said he was, and others said, No, but he sure looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, I am the same man. They asked, Who healed you? What happened? The man told them, The man they called Jesus made mud, mud and smoothed it over my eyes and told me, Go wash in the pool of Siloam and wash off the mud. I went and washed and now I can see. They asked him, Where is he now? I don't know. Then they took the man to the Pharisees. Now as it happened, Jesus had healed the man on a Sabbath. The Pharisees asked the man all about it, so he told them. He smoothed the mud over my eyes, and when it was washed off, washed away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man, Jesus, is not from God, for he is working on the Sabbath. Others said, but how can an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees once again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, This is the man who opened your eyes. Who do you say he is? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. The Jewish leaders wouldn't believe that he had been blind, so they called in his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he see? His parents replied, We know this is our son, that he was being born blind. But we don't know how he can see or who healed him. He's only not to see for himself and ask him. They said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said, He's old enough to speak for himself. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, Give glory to God by telling the truth, because we know Jesus is a sinner. I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied, but I know this, I was blind and now I can see. But what did he do? How did he heal you? But the man explained, Look, I told you once, didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear or get it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they cursed him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know anything about him. Why, that's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know anything about him. Well, God doesn't listen to sinners, but he's ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Never since the world began has everyone, anyone be able to open, his, open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't do it. You were born in sin. Are you trying to teach us? and they threw him out of the synagogue. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? Because I would like to. Yes, Lord, I believe. The man said, and he worshipped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, I come to judge the world. Pharisees who were standing there heard him and asked, Are you saying we are blind? Jesus replied,
thank you guys. That scripture has so much dialogue in it that I thought it's kind of nice to do it, to hear the different, the different voices speaking. I'm going to mention a few things about the man. He lived in the darkness of blindness all his life. We know he was an adult. We're not told how old he is. Uh, but he, ne he didn't know what it was like to see. He had parents. He was a beggar. He was supported by the generosity of people he couldn't see. The people in his community knew him. It sounds to me like he was intelligent. He was a logical thinker because he was able to debate with the Pharisees. And he was spiritual as well. He started connecting even before he met Jesus the second time. He also noticed that he didn't call out to Jesus. He didn't ask Jesus to heal him. Nobody brought him to Jesus like happened in some of the other stories. And it would seem to, from, uh, from the context that he would have been sitting outside the temple gates, probably along with others, begging from the people going by to and from the temple. He was focused on survival. That was his, his focus each day. The story takes place just after the Feast of Tabernacles. There's lots of people in Jerusalem. And Jesus has been, if you read chapter 8, you'll see that Jesus was in a number of heated conversations with the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders. He had made some very, very bold claims about himself. He claimed that God was his father. And he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in, in darkness, but will have the light of life. And now as he leaves the temple, the, the temple grounds, the, uh, the inner part of the temple, he sees a man living in darkness and living in darkness is in different senses of the word we're told as jesus went along he saw a man blind from birth i had to wonder how did he know the man was blind from birth i also wondered had jesus seen him sitting there before jesus and the disciples jesus went to the temple so had the man been sitting there before and bill i think of your question um, you know one one daughter healed another child isn't Jesus may have walked by that man a number of times. We're not told. But this time it says that Jesus saw him. Jesus saw him. We've talked about Jesus seeing the crowd before he fed the 5,000 with the five loaves of bread and two fish. We talked about Jesus walking on the water out to uh, the disciples on the lake. And, and Jesus saw the disciples in the boat fighting against the strong winds and the huge waves the, before he walked out to them on the water. Jesus saw. He saw the man. Jesus sees differently than you and I do. He sees right into the heart. He sees the longings and the dreams and the struggles and the desires. And he sees with compassion. The, the disciples also saw the man, but they didn't see the man the same way. They see someone to judge. Probably someone to look down on and feel better than themselves. Because their immediate statement is, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And I had to think. They, they thought, someone must have done something wrong. I wonder who. And probably, again, looking at themselves and, and being glad that they're not in that situation. And then I wondered what the man felt as he heard people talking about him casually discussing his sinfulness. Almost like he wasn't there. And Jesus answers the disciples' question. He says, neither. It was neither the parents nor the man. Being born blind doesn't mean that somebody sinned. Something different is going on. Something more mysterious and more hopeful. Our loving, wise God is doing something new. God's light, his son Jesus, is shining into the darkness of the world, making all things new. Things are changing. And Jesus doesn't say what caused, what's the cause of the blindness. Rather, he talks about God being glorified through this man. And God's glory is displayed as Jesus brings the healing power of God to bear upon this man's life. And the man is healed and not only is he healed, but his life is transformed, and he goes on to witness for what Jesus did for him, and believes in him, and worships him. 
We're not going to go through the whole story, but there's two things I want to highlight. First, Jesus didn't speak to the man. He speaks to the disciples. Again, what we're told, he speaks to the disciples. But he doesn't speak to the man first. The man didn't see Jesus. He was blind. He was blind when Jesus spit on the ground and made the mud. He was still blind when Jesus put the mud on his eyes. But I would imagine the man was hearing Jesus. He heard what Jesus said. And I've heard that, in some, that, in, in, that when we lose one sense, our other senses, uh, they, they make up for the loss. They increase and they intensify. We had friends who had a dog that was born blind. And that dog could run all over their house and into their backyard and all over. No trouble at all. Uh, it's, other senses take over when you have a sense that, that uh, is, is affected. The man heard Jesus' voice. He listened to what was going on. And something in his tone of voice, something about what he heard compelled him to obey Jesus when Jesus told him to go and wash. And so he went. He went and washed, and he was healed. And he went home seeing. He also got into a lot of trouble with the Pharisees because Jesus healed him. Even his parents didn't stand up for him. They were concerned about getting kicked out of the synagogue. But when Jesus found him later, the man, I believe, recognized him partly because of his voice. And Jesus identifies himself to the man as the Son of God, the Son of Man, the very revelation of God here on earth. And the man recognizes Jesus' voice. Now he sees Jesus. And we're told that he responds to Jesus, Lord, I believe. And he worships him and he commits his life to Jesus. And God is glorified in his life. His life is transformed beyond just the physical healing. His life has tra transformed. The light of the world has come and changed his darkness into light. And this man who once lived in darkness now lives in light. He lives in the light of being able to see. He lives in the light of who Jesus is. And it's interesting that in the next chapter, in John chapter 10, Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd. And he says, my sheep listen to my voice. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. The blind man who now sees heard Jesus' voice and he responds to it. And now he is one of Jesus' sheep. And the glory of God has been revealed in his life. But on the other hand, we have the Pharisees. The Pharisees who wouldn't believe. The Pharisees who made demands and criticisms about anything that Jesus said. And Jesus says, these ones that have good eyes, he calls them blind. So the man heard Jesus and responded to Jesus. Second, Jesus sees. You've heard me say this before. I just think this is so very, very important. Jesus sees. Oh, that our eyes would be opened to see like Jesus, to see beyond our own questions, our own judgments, our own impossibilities, to what God might do or is doing in our own lives and the lives of people around us. Speaker at, at our annual delegate session in uh, Saskatoon last weekend, his name was David Fitch. It was really, really good. <laughs> and the one thing he emphasized over and over to us was that the very presence of Jesus lives within us. As followers of Jesus, the very presence of Jesus lives in us. We are witnesses for Jesus. We carry the presence of Jesus within us. So when we see people around us, Jesus is there. Jesus is there. May we really see people like Jesus did. The people who are among us and around us. People we work with, that we live with. People who cross our path in the course of a day or a week or a month. And may we open ourselves to see through the eyes of Jesus the hearts of longing and of desire and of dream the dreams and the struggles of the people who are around us. And David talked about making space. May we make space for God's presence to be manifest in our conversations and, and encounters with others. The very presence of Jesus is there with us. 
What does he desire to do? And Davis told us story after story of how lives were changed as all he did is prayed and, and, and said, Lord, you're, you're here, Jesus, and opened up a space in the midst of the conversations for Jesus' presence to be manifest. God can work through us to bring healing to eyes that don't see Jesus. And I'm not talking necessarily about physical healing, but people whose eyes may slowly open to see how much Jesus loves them, that he wants to heal them and restore them and forgive them and work among the very struggles of their lives and make them part of his new creation. And that God may be glorified and magnified in their lives as they're made new. John confronts us again today with this sign about who Jesus is and I believe who we are then as we walk as his witnesses and as his testimony in our world today. May we respond and live in light of our response to him. Let's pray together. Oh God, I thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who lives within us, the Holy Spirit who is the very presence of Jesus within us, the Holy Spirit who, who reveals the word that Jesus spoke and that reveals who God is. Lord, may we appreciate and realize in, a, in, a, in even a little bit bigger way today that when we're out and about, God is already working in our world. God is already working in the lives of people to make them open to your presence. And Lord, that we would allow that, that space, that time, to see what you desire to do. I think of our community, oh God. People in our community that, that know, you, know you a little, but there's so much more. People who may not know you at all people who are struggling in life, that you desire to work in those situations. And Lord, as we, as we go about our activities, I pray that doors may be opened, that we, can, we, we will run into people. And Lord, that our eyes may be opened as Jesus saw people, that our eyes may be opened a little bit too, that we can invite you into those conversations and those situations and see what you desire to do. Lord, I believe that there are many around us who desire more, who want to know more. They're hungry for something more, but they're not sure what it is. Lord, I pray that your light may shine in our community and beyond, the light of Jesus Christ, that many may come to know you either for the first time or in a, in a fuller way than they have before. Thank you for your word, your word that is such an encouragement but yet is also an encouragement and a challenge for us to go out and bear that light of Jesus Christ in the world around us. Lord, prepare us, prepare our hearts, and prepare those around us for these kinds of encounters, I pray, that people may come to know Jesus. Thank you, O oh God, for each one that's here. I pray that as, as, uh, as you have blessed us, you will make us a blessing as we go out into our work again. And I pray that you would so even surprise us with opportunities, unexpected opportunities, to share the love and the joy and the forgiveness that can be found in Jesus Christ. Thank you, O oh God, for your goodness and for the trust and the hope that we can have in you in Jesus' name. Amen.